Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Sister Wives with Mary Jane K. Today, I'll be breaking down part two of Cody's cringiest moments. I have enough moments to do two or three more videos, and there are even cringier moments than these. They're in no particular order. I just wanted to keep the video short. There will be even cringier moments from Cody Brown I couldn't fit in here. There will be a Robin's cringiest moments, Nella breakdancing moves and all. The creepy dollhouse, the creepy sketch with Cody in place of her ex and a recreated family photo, and more. Also a Janelle's badass moments video where I'll bring Janelle's best, her fabulous F you to Cody, her talking about going to rock shows, and rock star Janelle not allowing Cody to kick her sons out when Robin's adult kids get to live at home. There's more as well. I'm excited to eventually bring it all to you, particularly Robin's cringiest and Cody's part three. There will be some excruciatingly cringe moments in that. I wish I could include here. I just didn't want the video to get too long. Cody is the Michael Scott of the polygamist world. Every time I watch the show, the lack of self-awareness baffles me. And I almost watch it like a mockumentary at this point in terms of Cody. Let's get into the first cringy moment. This is a moment on season eight, episode three, Courting Another Wife, where Cody and his wives are visiting another polygamist family, the Colliers. They go to dinner and Cody says that most men enter the principle because they think the wife that they currently have is the only crazy woman in the world. He says when you guys, meaning his wives, visit and you talk and you see yourselves as normal, but you're a foreigner to me. Cody says as he gets to know them, the women, his wives, he finds that they are less crazy, but that they are more endearing. And he develops a very sweet and intimate relationship with four wives. Ethan Collier calls it functionally crazy. He says it's the inability to relate with what they, his wives, are saying. Then, because they live in the same house and their natural cycles are synchronized, he has one week of, his wife interjects and says her husband, Nathan, calls it hell week. Cody adds on, he's telling you that time of the month, Janelle is pissed. She warns Cody, don't go there, don't go there. Janelle explains that it frustrates her beyond belief when women are reduced to their biology, like somehow women are slaves to biology. She admits PMS is a real thing in her confessional scene. Cody goes there. At the table, he says, somebody, actually, thank you very much, dear wife, admitted to it. And Christine reveals, it was her. With PMS, I'm bad, she says. Cody says, am I right? He asks. So that demon that comes to visit, that demon, it's scary. Christine responds, yeah, move out of the way for a couple of days, man, and I'll be fine. Janelle says there is so much more going on with women than just their biology. And men are so quick to be like, well, three days a month, I don't have to do anything because she is on her cycle. She says, what the hell? What does that mean? In her confessional scene. Back at the table, Cody says he was thinking something was wrong with him and it got abusive because he started going, I'm not a bad husband. I'm not a bad husband. Janelle says she is so... She gets up and she walks out and says she will see everyone in the car. This is just getting ridiculous. Janelle leaves as she mumbles, freaking hell. And Cody continues on as she leaves the meal unfazed. He says he didn't know what was wrong with him. He says he felt abused because he was starting to blame himself for everything that was wrong. In confessional, Janelle says she tries to stop the conversation before she completely loses her cool here and she's completely an ass here in front of everybody. She just excused herself from the situation. And here Cody behaves as if he is a victim to his wife's PMS and that his wives are abusive towards him and he blames himself as if he's the victim. It's a very patriarchal and misogynistic view of women. And I don't blame Janelle for not wanting to hear Cody's self-serving bullshit. With the stench, it probably ruined her appetite anyways. Cody just said his wives are abusive to him during PMS and he blamed himself and it's not on him. It's his crazy wives suffering from PMS. 
And apparently, to Cody, your period prevents women from rationalizing or controlling their behavior and emotions. And men are victims of women who suffer from PMS or who are on their cycle. This is such a misogynistic bullshit and so cringe. Next up on Cody's cringiest moments is when Cody anointed Caleb as a king after his father had Caleb kneel down and he knighted him at Maddie's wedding. And Cody made the whole wedding about him and his ego. All eyes on the Cody Brown, the star of the show. This comes from season 11, episode six, Maddie Gets Married. Cody gets to be the star of his daughter's wedding. He showboats even on the day of his daughter's wedding. And he's officiating the wedding between Caleb Brush and his first daughter to wed, Maddie. Cody decides it would be a good idea to announce he was making Caleb a king since he is marrying his precious daughter. And of course, Cody is the king. So of course, he would see it as completely normal and natural to first do a knighting ceremony and then for him to declare Caleb king as part of the wedding vows. Cody's an important man, a powerful man, the king of Lehi. And before Caleb can be worthy to marry his daughter, the king of Lehi must first have Caleb knighted and bestow titles upon him so he's worthy. Cody is sitting with Nathan in this episode who is married to Mary's sister Rebecca. Nathan is Cody's consultant and best friend and Cody has learned a lot of principles from Nathan and he's running ideas by him right before the wedding to figure out what to say during the ceremony as the officiant. Cody is bouncing a lot off of Nathan to make sure it's a clean fit. Cody points out he wants to be concise here. He admits he does a lot of hem hong. He does a lot of then he changes his thoughts and says, when he gets up in front of a crowd, the nervousness just makes him want to throw away the talk he's got and start over. Maddie thinks her dad is overanalyzing vows because he overanalyzes a lot. Maddie thinks her dad is overthinking it and that he's nervous about what other people are going to think of what he says. It's 15 minutes to go time and a manic Cody is still trying to figure shit out. He's trying to keep it to 12 minutes, he says. 12 minutes, including the nighting, or not. Cody says if he kept it to five minutes, everybody would be rejoicing. He says his confessional scene that being brief would be an opportunity in some ways, but this is an opportunity, and in some ways, he doesn't want to leave anything unsaid. Cody philosophizes with Nathan. He says if you look at his life and at what his belief system is, love and marriage are the essence of the gospel because it makes the world go round. Cody explains he's handing the baton of his love for his daughter from himself to another man. He wants there to be no doubt in Maddie's mind about how much he loves her. After Mike, Caleb's father, has him kneel down and he knights him, Cody announces that since Caleb has just been knighted, now he's going to make Caleb King. Cody announces he's a journaler. He's got tons of journals and he writes in them. Journals, 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 he says, and he writes lovely things about beautiful people like Maddie. He says, when you've almost lost what is precious, you realize her value. Cody says, when Maddie was just a baby at just eight months old, she was under her birth weight and years later, she had the emergency appendectomy which left her in the hospital. An overwhelming panic and a realization that Maddie may not make it set in, and Cody found himself on his knees to his God, saying thank you and all this abundance in saving her. And Cody wants to share with the guests some of the thoughts from that experience. He wants to share some of the thoughts and feelings that he has had about his daughters. Cody, Cody, Cody. Even on Maddie's wedding day, the focus of the ceremony is Cody and his feelings and thoughts because after all, it's always a Cody-centric world for the King of Lehi. Cody shouts, Madison Rose lives and I praise God the Almighty, the grateful, happy heart. What a wonderful life, Cody says. Cody then announces his wishes during the ceremony that all his daughters marry righteous men and that his grandchildren will embrace the gospel. I didn't ever see a wedding ceremony where the officiant, rather than go on about love and marriage and the couple doing the ceremony, focusing on them and their marriage, instead of the officiant 
the father of the bride focusing on his wishes and how he feels and what he wants and wishes for himself, his life, all of his kids and grandkids. Cody says as these things happen, he tends to go through his musings in these special journals. He reads some poetry here, courtesy of the Cody Brown. Here it goes. Curious eye, demanding pout, golden locks, full pouting lips. Daddy, look at me, she screams with all the enthusiasm of the Christmas time child. She's the princess she thinks she is. And I feel like the king of the universe, bequeathing all the wealth to her to share someday. I hope an eternity from now and much later, with the next guy to wrap around her finger, God bless him to love her as much as I do. I will tell you about love. I have loved this daughter since the moment she was born. Cody then says he's been married four times and he feels that kind of joy today. Dearly beloved, he says, I'd like to share with you the meanderings of my marriage experience. And Cody does a fake ha 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 to prompt everyone to laugh at his unfunny joke that no one got that fell way short. Cody says, never use sarcasm unless it's in reference to your friends and family, but never to each other. Cody says faith is trusting loyalty. A woman's faithfulness is trusting loyalty. He goes on that trust is the highest form of human motivation. He says, motivate your spouse by trusting them in a poop storm of negativity. Always be one another's safe harbor. Pray together, dream together. Last, remember that the love you share is magnified by service to God and the world. So love each other. Finally, Cody asks if Caleb takes Maddie as his wife, and it was asked if they accept all the oaths and covenants and contracts till eternity, and Cody forgot the rings. He explains, they didn't do rings in his ceremonies with his wives. Cody says marriage is a covenant and a contract, and you're striking a deal. He admits he completely blitzed the ring thing since they don't exchange rings during their church ceremonies. Janelle says... Cody always gets there in the end. She was worried in the middle of his speech. She had her doubts with a little bit of it, but that's always Cody. And Cody was happy with everything. He was very pleased with himself with the ceremony he did. I've never seen a ceremony more focused on the officiant. I'll tell you that. In this next cringy moment coming from season 15, episode 10, Polygamist Hell, Cody and his wives get together on Coyote Pass at Janelle's request to try to figure out rules for conversation as a family so everyone can communicate more effectively together. Christine mentions being tired of leaving conversations and not feeling like she matters. Robin thinks if they're honest and everyone talks to each other like they're for real and everyone is kind and easy, it could help them a lot. Mary is going into this conversation open and slightly guarded because you just never know who will be in a pissy mood, who will be on attack, who will be defensive. You just never know how people will be going into a conversation like this. Janelle doesn't have a plan. She just talked to everyone individually and told them her thoughts previous to this meeting. Janelle wants everyone to write down what they all need, bottom line, from a conversation. Cody is already in his petulant pouty phase when he arrives, his head is resting on his hand, and he looks pissed before the thing even starts. He's already checked out. Janelle hands out markers so everyone can talk about how to communicate. They need rules for how to have conversations, and she puts up a large sketch pad on an easel, and Cody says he doesn't get what they are there to talk about, what they are talking about. Cody is all sarcasm and cynicism, and he asks, are we going to talk about our feelings? Mary tells Cody they are talking about their communication. Cody explains in confessional that he's coming into this conversation very cynical because he's extremely discouraged that he can't get his wives to all agree on one simple thing, preventing the spread of COVID in their family. And so it's pissing him off. Janelle writes that she needs to make sure she's heard during conversations. She says she thinks they've had communication problems for a long time. Her life slowed down a lot during the COVID shutdown, and she had time to do a lot of reflecting on her own personal communication styles, and she began to see a bigger picture and a bigger pattern. 
Christine says she needs to feel important at the end of a conversation. She feels like her ideas aren't important in the end and she doesn't have a say. Janelle validates Christine here. She says, you don't feel heard. We hear you, but we sort of discount your ideas. And Christine agrees. She says, yeah, and everyone assumes she is just being a princess because she is not expressing herself well and she's not ever intending to be a princess. But she thinks she is seen that way as a princess, and that's frustrating. Christine explains in confessional that during conversations, she really does try to speak authentically, and she admits maybe she's overdramatic or flipping her hair sometimes, but it doesn't mean that she doesn't want to be heard. Cody feels like everybody feels that same way, like it's a fight constantly to have an idea even heard. Robin asks Cody what he's going to write down since everyone's participating. And Cody responds, nothing, petulantly. He's sulking, looking down, not making eye contact. Robin says to Cody, yes, he is. He has to play. He will be writing something down like she's his mother. Cody says his problem is he doesn't want to write anything down there because he doesn't give a shit anymore. In confessional, Cody says, we moved here. We're going through the struggles. He's been arguing about COVID now for so long with these ladies. He says that's the reason he doesn't care anymore. He doesn't enjoy the relationships anymore because it feels like a constant fight. Cody says he doesn't want to write anything and Christine asks what he means. Cody responds, anytime they get together and he or she or somebody in the family tries to express themselves, they end up at these really, really bad places. In confessional, Janelle says she thinks Cody is in a darker place today and he has expressed to her he is tired. He's tired of being the middle guy and tired of trying to facilitate these conversations. Cody says it feels like when they meet, there is this lack of respect for the values of others and he is just as guilty as everybody else. Sometimes he doesn't want to hear an idea. He doesn't care. In Christine's confessional scene, she asks, then why are we here? Why are we doing this? She asks, so he doesn't care? So he doesn't care? He doesn't think we need to do this? He doesn't care about what? What does he not give a shit about? She asks. She says it's taking all of her self-control to just stay. It's ridiculous. Back at Coyote Pass, Cody says he's cynical because he's just stopped trying. He's just stopped trying to get the family united and all going in the same direction being sensitive, and he just got cynical. Cody says he's in the depths of frustration. He is in polygamy hell. Cody says they don't respect each other's values or value each other's values. He says in realizing the place they are at, they don't share the same values. Cody says he's not talking about morals or religion. He's talking about just basic values. They don't share them. In confessional, Cody says, Maybe it's his own communication skill. Maybe it's just crap. But they've been sitting arguing about this over and over, and he is just done with it. Mary says it's scary because she looks at Cody as the head of their family, and to have the leader say, I don't care anymore, she wonders, where does that leave us? Mary says she needs to do what she can to hold the family together, and that's why Janelle is doing this, to do what she can to hold the family together because the family is falling apart and it's scary to marry. Cody says he doesn't want to write anything down and he doesn't give a shit anymore. He says if everybody is happy where they are living, great, they can sell this property. He says they aren't one family anymore and in all of their years in Vegas, they struggled to be this one family. And as Cody went through that process, he realized how vastly different each part of his family is with their own values. And they got to Flagstaff and Cody feels like he no longer has to struggle with it anymore because they aren't as close together. He doesn't see Team Brown anymore. Danelle thinks they are right on the cusp of being separate or being together. In theory and in name, they are all together, one team, but they really aren't working as a team. Christine reads from the Cody Brown family mission statement. It talks about unity, love, respect, and commitment. She reads, Our family is forever joined for the purpose of developing our own divine energy and raising righteous children. As sister wives and husband, we embrace one another with the covenant of eternal nature, we enjoy being together as a family because we have developed a safe, pleasant, and peaceful atmosphere where we love and respect one another. Mary loves it. It reminds her of better times, and she wants the family to get back to that, and she gets scared that they aren't going to. 
Christine says they worked really hard on it and it took months and months and months to work on it. And it would be easier to forget about the mission statement and to just do their own thing. She says, is it so much work to come back together again and to want to be together again? Is it just too hard, she asks the group. Christine says their relationships are optional and she brought the family mission statement on purpose, hoping to inspire everybody. And she doesn't know where everyone is at. Janelle was hoping if they could figure out how to communicate, then it might not seem so hard because she is hearing that nobody listens. And Christine agrees. Is so drained after conversations with the family that she shuts down and she has to go to her room. She can't even take care of her girls. Janelle says it's the first time she was hearing that this completely wrecks Christine. She says it's easy for her to say, whatever, grow up, grow a pair, but she has to acknowledge that Christine feels like this. Christine says Cody is using the word values, and she says she thought they had the same values, so that's new for her. Cody responds, for years, they tried doing things together, and in the end, they determined that working together for them wasn't safe. And he is at a point now where he sees the family as an obstacle to his own goals. And he says they aren't happy. The five of them aren't happy. And his wives say if he wasn't in the picture, they'd get along. But that's such bullshit. Cody says he's seen the women treat each other so shitty for so many years that he can't take it anymore as if he's the victim in all of this. Janelle says she is looking at Cody like, what the hell planet did you come from? We are in this plural family. And he has agreed to this. And saying he considers the family an obstacle to his own goals is about the most selfish thing she has ever heard. But in the spirit of communication, she has to hear him. And she has to realize that this is where Cody is at right now. Cody says they have their guidebook, the family mission statement, that is their beacon and their goal of what they want to accomplish. But they are so far from it that it feels like hypocrisy. The children are getting older and Cody wonders what he wants to do with the rest of his life. Robin says during her confessional scene that it scares her when Cody talks like that and it makes her feel very alone. But his attitude is that they are all making their own decisions, all of his wives, and they are all very independent and they don't want to listen to him and they don't want to work as a team anymore. So that frees him of the responsibility being captain and rallying the troops, according to Robin. And it's scary to her and she doesn't like it. Janelle mentions that she talks to her mom once a week and her mom has a wonderful relationship with her sister wife and that's her whole social group. So Janelle can see family and her sister wives as the social group. This is the social group she wants, but she doesn't know what it looks like without the kids to focus on. So they have to rethink what they will look like. Janelle has been thinking with the kids growing up and moving out that there would be a paradigm shift in the focus of their family, but they need to craft what the group will look like. She wants to make the conscious choice to have her family as her community. This is the next cringy moment. It's from season 16, episode 10, the beginning of the end. And this is much more lighthearted. Cody, Robin, and their kids go to take a COVID spit test. And Cody's kids manage fine. But Cody, who wants to be seen as a capable leader and the head of the family, can seem to manage taking the spit test properly. He sucks up his own spit accidentally because he feels it's an automatic response to having a straw in your mouth. How does this guy drive? He says they're supposed to drool down the straw into the vial, and it's very straightforward. I haven't taken a COVID spit test, but I have taken a genetic spit test, and it's basically the same thing. You spit in a vial till it reaches the appropriate line, and that's it. You're done. It's that simple. Cody says it's gross. It is, but there are worse things in life that are much grosser than that. Robin and Cody explain to the guy in the line that they might take a bit longer. They have kids to work through. And we hear a big slurping sound and Cody says, Oh, I just sucked. Oh, I'm going to vomit dramatically as he laughs. Cody explains it away. He says, Oh man, you're sitting there spitting, paying attention to the kids who had no issues doing this, by the way. And you sort of lose your focus and he sort of sucked back up with the straw because a straw is designed for sucking, not blowing, right? That's what he asks. So he says he sucked it back up a little bit and he was like, oh God, his gag reflex was so high. 
And since he just did that, he's really suspicious that Saul and Ari will do it like crazy because they're just little and it's such a gross process. And I want to point out, they showed Saul and Ari doing the spit test as well. And Saul and Ari seem to have no problems at all. And they showed them doing the test during the scene. It was only Cody that had an issue. Finally, for our final cringy moment for part two, and I have a ton more coming, by the way, is Cody announcing to his guy friends on a guy's night out that he is an alpha male. Cody announces he's an alpha male a lot on the show, when typically alpha males don't announce it. They don't self-proclaim themselves as alpha males. It comes with a lot of connotations as well of toxic masculinity. It's not something to necessarily be proud of, and it's not something self-proclaimed. It's a trait that seems... So obvious, it doesn't need mentioning. Alpha males never proclaim themselves to be alpha males if they're really alpha males in reality. They don't announce it. There's no need to. Cody perceives himself in his own mind as an alpha male, and he wants to be seen as such. He doesn't seem to realize that announcing it, proclaiming it of himself, making announcements on the show and to his friends and on camera, actually makes people perceive him the opposite way. It doesn't reinforce his alpha malehood. If anything, it detracts from people viewing him the way he perceives himself as an alpha male. And also, why push to be perceived with toxic masculinity? It's very odd. And announcing it just makes people know clearly Cody isn't an alpha male. In this scene, he announces it to his friends. He mentions he's an alpha male many times in many different situations and many different episodes. I want to thank viewer Lisa who brought a few specific instances to my attention and they will all be included in my different cringy moments videos. In this episode, Boys Night Out, season 6, episode 13, Cody says there's a ton of weight on his shoulders regarding these relationships and how he has to manage them. He guarantees you he's in charge, but it's not because of his anatomy. It's because of his leadership. Cody's friend asks Cody if he ever has the ultimate say or do his wives run him back and forth until he gets tired and then they decide what he's going to do. Cody responds with no. He says his friends both know he is pretty much an alpha male but he's had to learn to chill. Cody asks rhetorically in confessional, why didn't I just macho up and go, yeah, sure, I'm in charge of my family. He responds to himself because everybody already knows that he is in charge of his family. He manages it subtly. He can't go around with women who are strong and boss them around and make it obvious. Cody learned if he is not in charge, then one of the wives is in charge and Cody can't have that. He can't have a wife being in charge of his other wives. Never, he says. That does it for this episode of Cody's Cringiest Moments. I have a ton more, even cringier moments. So these are in no particular order. And in the next month or two, I'll put out the next video. I have a long list of cringe. And there are awesome moments I would really love to break down. Thanks so much for watching. Look out for more Cringiest Moments from Cody and Robin. And Badass Moments too for Janelle. I'll be back tomorrow with the next episode of My Sister Wives Rewatch, Season 2, Episode 7, The Brown Family Decision. And I'll be back next week with another episode of Book Club, Part 2 of Chapter 4 on Robin and Cody. We'll dive deep into Shira, thanks to viewer Diana, who piqued my curiosity further on that cartoon character. And we'll also go over some math I did based on the date of Robin and Cody's engagement, how long Cody states the courtship was in the book, six months, versus Robin on the show saying 10 months. So we'll look into the math because Christine seemed very upset when she learned Robin and Cody kissed at the engagement, but she gave no reaction at all to Cody kissing Robin during Truly's birth. So I wonder if they were spiritually married earlier than their wedding reception. And maybe that's why Christine wasn't so upset. Or maybe she was and it just didn't air on the show. We don't know. But we'll go over some of those inconsistencies during book club next week. And I'll also continue with my rewatch as well. To all my YouTube viewers, please comment down below, like, and subscribe. I would love to hear your thoughts. And to everyone who got different cringy moments to me, they're all going to be included in the next cringy moments episodes coming up. I didn't forget about them. Please let me know your comments in the comment box. Like and subscribe. I would really appreciate that. Thanks so much for tuning in. See you soon. Bye.